For more than 40 years and 1,600 columns, one journalist's quest for truth and honesty has taken him down many dark and seedy paths, unrelenting and unafraid. Guided by the light of truth, he has traveled many difficult journeys as a watchdog for all, ever vigilant. Then, one day, the presses fell silent. The newspaper for which he toiled closed forever. Undeterred, the scribe goes on. Welcome to another edition of the Scribbler Publishing Group podcast. I'm your host, Bertram D'Souza. This podcast is designed to spotlight some of the 1,600 columns I wrote for the Youngstown Vindicator during my 40 years with the paper. A selection of the columns will be republished in an upcoming book. Today's segment will focus on the Mafia and the deep roots in the Mahoning Valley spanning three generations. My guests have intimate knowledge of the La Cosa Nostra, albeit in different ways. Retired FBI Supervisory Senior Resident Agent John Stoll is joining us via Skype from his home in South Carolina. Agent Stoll and another agent whose name is synonymous with the war on organized crime in the Valley, Robert Crona, have the distinction of taking down a long list of scumbags in this region, most notably mafia kingpin Lenin Lenny Strollo. In 1999, Stoll and Crona, along with then Assistant U.S. Attorney Craig Morford, persuaded Strollo to break his oath of silence and become a government snitch. In the studio with me is Mahoning County Prosecutor Paul Gaines, who, as the target of a mafia hit, was shot in his boardman home, but lived to tell the tale. Also participating in today's conversation about the mob is Cynthia Rickard, who spent 41 years at The Vindicator and is the editor of the book. John Stoll came to Youngstown in the summer of 1990 as a special agent from Huntington, West Virginia, and joined the Organized Crime Division in 1994 when longtime mafia fighter Larry Lynch retired. John served in the Organized Crime Division until 2001 and then assisted in the public corruption investigation of former Congressman James A. Trafficking, Jr. He was assigned as a supervisor in the FBI's Washington office for 18 months and retired in 2012. The day Stroller began chirping to the feds is the day that organized crime's stranglehold in the valley was broken. The Stroller case is especially intriguing because of the public's perception of the mafia and its strong commitment to secrecy. When the mob boss decided to tell all, it sent shockwaves throughout the country. Storl, Crona, and Morford succeeded in securing court authorization for wiretaps and audio surveillance of a restaurant that was a mob hangout and of Stroller's Canfield mansion and his telephone. There are 2,000 hours of recording made from November 1996 to December 1997 that reveal the inner workings of the mafia in the valley. There are conversations about the hit on mobster Ernie Biandello and concerns about Paul Gaines defeating then-prosecutor James Philomena in the 1996 Democratic primary, Gaines went on to win the November general election. He was shot in his home on December 24, 1996 by Mark Bacho, who ultimately turned state's witness and is serving time in prison. Today, the Mafia is a bitter memory for decent law-abiding residents of the Valley and stuff of legends for the folks who consider Strollo and others of his ilk to be folk heroes. Let's get started. Without archives, many stories of real people would be lost. And along with those stories, vital clues that allow us to reflect and interpret our lives today. We have seen prosperity and hardship, cultural shifts and time-honored rituals, benevolent citizens, and dubious characters. For the past 145 years, Mahoning Valley Historical Society has built an invaluable archive of our people and their stories. Our collections have been a rich resource for all who search for clues and connections to our community's history. Visit us online at mahoninghistory.org to see why collecting Mahoning Valley history is our pledge to you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for joining us and for taking the time 
to chat with us about uh, your experiences and your long tenure in Youngstown, especially with your uh, involvement in investigating organized crime. Um, so let me start with this question. Of all the infamous racketeers in the Mahoning Valley, uh, Charlie Cavallaro, Jimmy Prado, Joey Naples, Ernie Biandello, Charlie Carabia, Bernie Alshula, and Lenny Strollo, Strollo is the last man standing. And that's ironic uh, because of all those mobsters, Strollo is the only one who violated the oath of secrecy and became a government snitch. And so the question that I have been pondering for a long time is, how is it that Strollo is still alive and wasn't killed because of what he did? Or at the least, how come he didn't go into the federal government protection program? So give us, uh, give us some of that background. Okay. There. Well, when you mentioned those guys, those are Youngstown organized crime guys. Right. Well, if you look at the nation, many more before him have gone it and uh, worked for the government, you know, broke the oath. So he's not the first one. He won't be the last one. So uh, I think that probably came into his thinking, and he knew he was getting on in the years, and he didn't know what kind of sentence he was facing. And I think he decided to pack it in and, and do something the other guys before him have already done. And he see, saw that some of them are still alive, and he probably said, he'll roll the dice and go with it. Um, so uh, as far as him uh, going out on a limb, it was it was to a point. Now, he was in the protection uh, program, the witness security program, run by the marshals. And so he was in a separate prison uh, actually, uh, a separate wing of a prison out in Phoenix. Okay. And, uh, while there, in fact, one time I had to go meet him out there, and uh, it was funny. He was complaining about uh, the jobs they give you, and uh, because of his age, they were only giving him a job of filling short shakers and uh, you know, <laughs> take care of somewhere. I mean, and he wanted to do more, but they said no. You know, that's for younger guys and things like that. So he was, uh, he didn't really like that. And he talked about one of the shows might have been A&E had a thing on, uh, on his case. And he said, everybody in the program out there is known by the initials. So his initials, they just called him LS. And on TV, they're talking about Lenny Strollo and the other guys in the unit are going, Hey, that's you. That's you. And he says, John, he says, everybody knows it's me, but I couldn't say it's me. So I said, no, that's not me. No, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> you got to feel for him. So, when the time was over, he had a choice of staying in, and then his wife would have to join him, and right. he would never see their relatives again. Uh, and it's a very hard program, and uh, his wife really didn't want to do that because she had uh, grandchildren. And so uh, he decided to take his chances and uh, go out there. And at that point, most of the Pittsburgh family was, was history. They were done, right. and there's really no the threat really wasn't there anymore. So uh, he took his chances. He lived out of state for a couple of years, and then he decided to move back to Youngstown. Yeah. Um, John, you and your former colleague, Bob Croner, who, yeah. uh, and, uh, and also with Gordon Clow, uh, played a major role in uh, Stroller's transition from mafia boss to government witness. Uh, tell us about him. Tell us your experiences with him, because a lot of people know who he is in this region. A lot of them have never met him, haven't talked to him. How was he towards you? Uh, how, how did you interact with him? Uh, give us some flavor of that, that uh, re relationship. Well, he was the same age as my parents. So wow. I kind of had that look, you know, uh, not, uh, the attitude maybe of, uh, you know, showing him some respect, that, that line. Um, he was... Uh, at first, very reluctant to uh, cooperate, and to him, he felt like he had uh, really been defeated. You know, he uh, he had some animosity, you know, with Bob Croner, yes. and uh, and you know, they Bob had been around a long, long time, right. and myself, and Craig Morford, and uh, Gordon, we were newcomers to, to this type of thing. Craig had you know experience prosecuting sure. before. So there wasn't much there, and there was room, I guess, for, for us to try to, you know, uh, break bread with him in a way to get him to cooperate. And what's a funny thing that happened, what really broke the ice, was uh, 
he decided to cooperate. Uh, we met with him and his lawyer that evening after he decided to do it at the U.S. Attorney's Office. And it was there at the federal, it's the federal courthouse. And he was, we tell he's really, you know, mad at Bob, you know, you won, blah, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and uh, he didn't want, and then Craig reminded him and his lawyer, you know, he has to cooperate. So we set up a meeting, it might have been a day or two later, at the Lake County Jail, that's where he's being held up in Painesville. So the night before this meeting, I got a call from my neighbor across the street. I live in Poland. And he said, hey, John, I, I met this, uh, I mean, uh, I found this dog, I think it was a husky, found this husky running down the street and had a long chain, like 20 foot chain. So I saw it must have got loose. So I, I had it and his husky had died like two years before he had a pen. So he put it in the pen. And so I'm thinking, okay, he uh, found a dog and he goes, but I called around to schools to see who was missing a dog. And the high school said, oh, one of the families, uh, they're missing their dog. And it's uh, the Hertz family. In fact, their father, Raymond Hertz, just went to federal prison for a, on a mob trial. So <laughs> he calls me. That's why he was calling me up. He goes, what do you know about this? And I said, well, that's Lenny Strollo's son-in-law. Yeah. And he was a heart attack. He's, oh, no. What am I going to do with it? And I said, no, no, no. I said, it, it'll be all right. Well, what happened was there's a family down the block. Their daughters were friends with Raymond's daughters. And evidently, the dog must have got loose, followed the car, and got lost, and then circled in our neighborhood looking for him, lost scent, whatever. And our neighbor found a dog. So the next day, so I told him, I said, okay, I'll, I'm going to see the fan, you know, uh, Lenny the next day tomorrow, and I'll mention it to him, and you get to, you know, find out how to get return this dog. And he goes, oh, you sure nothing's going to happen? I'm not going to watch out. No, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> the next day, Bob and I fall to Lake County Jail just as his wife. He's leaving. And uh, I said, Antoinette, I, I said, my neighbor found Raymond's dog. And he said, oh, my gosh, thank you so much. Da, 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 da. You know, very helpful. I got the number, you know, make contact, give it to my neighbor. He'd return the dog. And I went in and told Lenny the same thing. And he goes, oh, thank God you got the dog. The kids were so worried about it. And da, 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 da. So it was a good way to break the ice. It just luck on my, my part that that worked out that way. Yeah, as you pointed out, he did not like uh, Krona at all. Right. And, and, and in fact, uh, when I was preparing for this podcast, uh, Bob and I had long conversations. Uh, he had thought about joining us, but since he has a consulting firm and he's, you know, he's got a, a major account with uh, a local company for security, he was a little reluctant to get it. But he was telling me some of his stories, and he was telling me the story that when, when the FBI... Uh, executed the search warrant on Strollo's mansion in Canfield, and Bob Krona walks into the house. Strollo looks at him and says, now I'm going to have to sell this damn house because you walked in. <laughs> and I started laughing. I said, you know, that is a great story about, uh, you know, Lenny. Um, That's so true. But, and also, uh, one of the things also about Lenny was um, along the line is um, he was always paranoid about uh, the FBI talking, you know, listening to his phones. Right. And we weren't on his telephones too long when he would say things, um, you got that, Bob? <laughs> like, like, <laughs> saying that. And then we learned one time there was a, um, he lived out in Campfield. Um, yes. Oh, and there's a farmhouse across the street somebody was moving into. So Lenny was telling a story about the, uh, he had relatives or whatever, and he saw the, telephone guy on the pole and he came out to him and, go, and said you don't need to do that go ahead and print it right in my living room I'll bring it in the house you know you don't have to set it up that way and the telephone guy goes what are you talking about and he goes I know when you work at the FBI you're putting a, another wire telephone in my house and the phone guy 18 years old I don't know what you're talking about so he showed him the order and actually he was doing it for the house next across the street that was moving in so the line he goes oh okay the <laughs> He was just that paranoid. The person who bought the farmhouse, he called me when he was you know, thinking, when he was thinking, of, when he was thinking okay. of buying it. And he asked me if I should, he should be worried. And I said to him, I said, you know, when I first came to town, somebody suggested I move to the north side because that's where Joey Naple lived. And it was the safest neighborhood in the Mahoning Valley. 
And so I said, no, you'll be okay. I said, being across from the mob boss. But uh, um, so tell us, did Strollo give important information to the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office that oh, yeah. not only had, go ahead. I think before you get to that, sure. there's another thing about Lenny that, that I, I have too, is listening, we had the microphones and, and you know, his phone staff. 2,000 hours, right? Uh, tapes, yes. But <laughs> you, you hear the different people, uh, businessmen, politicians, coming to his house. Some people just ran like this. Everybody assumed he had money and coming with their ideas to get him to invest with them or what he should do and everything else. And then after they leave, you hear him talking to his wife saying, you know, uh, that's the most stupid idea, whatever it was. <laughs> but he was always polite to these people coming into his house, talk to him, and he says, okay, I'll think about it, I'll think about it. And then he leave and, and he would say, that's, yeah, so, you know, stupid. So in that way, I kind of felt sorry for him. So much of his time was wasted with these idiots, and, you know, other people come with lame brain schemes of how to get rich or to uh, bilk other people and everything else. And he would just, you know, say, okay, okay. And then, you know, I'll let you know and, and not do it and then talk about that and how bad they were, the ideas were and stuff. But how, how important was the information that he provided to the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office as far as um, dismantling organized crime in the Mahoning Valley? It was good. I mean, the... Uh, I mean, as far as the, his criminal organization, it was it opened it all up. There was going to be nothing left. And then he delved into the uh, corruption part. And that was a big uh, home run with us. I mean, that was the things. And, you know, even with when they attempted to kill Paul, yeah, uh, it was just totally, you know, out there. We didn't think there'd be such a thing. And, it, and they did it. And um, the corruption, you know, Philomena, what he was doing. I mean, in fact, we suspected all along here police officers saying Phil I mean it's corrupt corrupt but we had no way and then uh, when things opened up that you know opened the floodgates yeah so the public corruption aspect was 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 an important aspect because as we know that's why Gay, Paul is I've known Paul a long time by the way I knew when he was a police officer in Youngstown and was head of the union and took them out on strike um, <laughs> but the reason that we have Paul here True. we have the reason we have Paul here is because he was the target of a mafia hit. And right. obviously, Georgie Alexander was involved in that, and uh, Bernie Allshuler, and all of this. On the tapes, was there any discussion about, I, I know there was discussion about the hit on Ernie Biandello. I mean, that was, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, Strollo's paranoia, and, 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 you know, this sort of, uh, but was there any discussion about the hit on Paul that you can recall? Uh, we could tell that they didn't like Paul. They, for some reason, they thought that Bob was going to call, but Bob was going to, Paul was going to name Bob as his investigator. Right. Yeah. And I was getting George Alexander putting his little yeah. two cents in there, irritating people all the time. And, but that wasn't the main reason. The main reason when Philomena had that hundred thousand deal with the dollar deal with, uh, Mo Man, uh, what's his name? Um, Antoine Harris. A Antoine, uh, Mo Man Harris, right. They had a deal. They were going to make $100,000, Philomena was, and then Lenny was supposed to get part of that uh, if they carried out and, and got rid of Paul. I mean, if, if if that deal had gone through earlier, Lenny would get none, none of that 100000 That was all going to be Philomena and uh, maybe George Alexander, I'm not sure. But, uh, but because they needed to get rid of Paul, then they approached Lenny. You know, because during Lenny's, uh, when he testified, I think it was in the Phil Chance uh, trial, uh, he was asked the question about organized crime activities, and he had this statement that, that sort, of, um, sort of gave us an impression of what was going on for so long in the Mahoney Valley. He said, in our business, murder is business. You know, they were talking about Ernie Biandello's killing, and, and showed no regret showed no, you know, sort of, I feel bad because we've taken another human being's life. And I wonder if that is the person you met with when you were talking, when he was, when he had, was doing his soul searching and had come to Jesus moment, whether that's the person you actually, actually saw. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, what he was doing was, you know, wrong. But also he had this, um, I think it was a little personal as well with uh, Ernie Biandello. Uh, yeah, 
Ernie or Ernie had, you know, uh, wouldn't fall in line with like some other people had. Right. But what was interesting was the day Ernie Bandela was shot, we had a pole camera on the house, and within hours, Frank and the team was over there at Lenny's house. You know, I, we we couldn't see it, but we know he was probably <laughs> slobbering all over him, trying to say, "Hey, you know, uh, I'll be I'll, I'll I'll play your game." You know, I, I don't get me either. So. <laughs> Yeah, because you're used to, it, it was a time when the FBI told Ernie Biandello to wear right. a bulletproof vest That's because right. you had heard that, you know, he was going to be a target That's and that right. he used, he wore it for a while and That's then, right. and then he was on this, he was caught on this street that was narrow and he couldn't pass and he couldn't go forward because they, somebody well, had his, yeah, and in the back they hemmed him in and then two guys came out from the woods and started shooting him. But... Right. And Blair, yeah. Yeah. But in that whole shooting is when Paul's shooting got somehow tied in. And if you could tell us the story about when, after they had killed Ernie, one of them, who was it? Uh, one of them grabbed the EB One of them ring. reached out and grabbed Ernie Biandello's ring that had right. EB with, made out of diamonds. Right. And, and it took, it took it. Right. They went to a Pittsburgh pawn shop. Well, and then that's where we found out, you know, we uh, the age of Pittsburgh and they found a thing. It was uh, George Wilkins was, okay. was clear in on that. And uh, and that was another thing, too. George uh, Wilkins and in Cleveland Blair, both of those guys testified. Uh, they were both offered the witness security program. George turned it down and Cleveland Blair took it. And he had did the same thing like Lenny in the uh, witness security pr program in prison when he got out. He didn't want to uh, stay in it, and he wanted to leave the area, not come back here. Uh, hopefully, he never got back in trouble. Uh, I think he was going to be a truck driver or something like that in uh, down south. But George Wilkins stayed, came back to Youngstown, and got caught up in drugs, and uh, all guys prosecuted him right. later on. One of the one of the uh, theories, and this I heard from Joey Nap one of Joey Naples' relatives, is the reason he was killed is because. When the mob, after the mills closed and you know all of their traditional gambling and all uh, dried up, uh, Strollo, with the from the urging of I think it was Bernie Alshula, decided to look into making deals with these gang bangers, drug pushers from Youngstown, uh, to get into that business. And I was told that Joey Naples did not want to get into the drug business because he felt that you know they put kids in jeopardy and all of that, and sort of had an argument with Lenny over that. Uh, is there any uh, sort of uh, basis to that? I never heard any. We never saw anything to that. Okay. So the killing of Joey Naples is an interesting one because when he went out to the construction site for the mansion he was building in Beaver Township, he went right. alone. Usually, uh, Pinto Holowatic, his bodyguard, drove him around in this Mercedes sedan that had white wall tires, the only one I think in the country where a Mercedes has white wall tires. And I used to see him parked in front of Hanai's office all the time. But the night he was killed, he went out and he drove a late model Mustang. Right. And that you found. Can you tell us that story as, as to what, uh, what happened with the killing of, of Joey? I, uh, he was in Goodfellows. I forgot the guy's name. He's from uh, Pittsburgh. Tuki DeLeo. There you go. And, uh, and he was a, an actor in, in Goodfellas. Plus, he was a music producer who did a lot of production for Michael Jackson, a lot right, of the videos. Right. right. And he was a friend of Naples. Right. And then Joey was a neatnik. And uh, every night or so, he'd go out to the construction site in North Lima where they built his uh, big house. And he would uh, change shoes once he got out of the car, go in the shoot or front of the house, whatever and uh, sweep up all the sawdust and everything else inside the building. And then uh, either when he first got there or when he was done, across the street was a cornfield, and that's where uh, the shooters were, right. the shooter shooters. I think we saw two sets of footprints there. Right. And uh, that's where they ended up getting him. So I have my theory as to who shot him, and a couple of law enforcement types have confirmed that they believe 
It's never come out. And one of the columns I wrote is unfinished business. And the question was, who killed Joey Naples? Why hasn't that ever been solved? Um, just not enough evidence. One of the things that pointed us to was, uh, and it's a small thing, was the rubber boots. We took some foot footprints of the scene, and they were these rubber over boots or galoshes you pull off your shoes, and a kind of a grainy, pebbly texture in the bottom of them. And when we, uh, we found footprints there, and then we... One, one of the things about that, again, is um, in the cornfield, uh, we found those footprints. Uh, and we, Beaver Township, Carl Frost and the guys made the uh, cast. And then from the cast, uh, we, you know, they held on to them. In the, I was down there, uh, we had information that they were heading down there. We, we followed them down there, and uh, they were very good as far as anti-surveillance. Uh, very, very good. And um, during the attempt to arrest them, it got botched up, um, and we recovered items they left in the woods uh, after they took off. And we found the rubber over up galoshes, rubber galoshes type thing, the same type. Later that year. Right same rubber type boots with the galoshes on them. I mean, uh, these boots don't really leave a good print like a sneaker would or anything else, but uh, to collect the evidence, but it was just very coincidental that they had the same type of rubber boots there. And then we had, you know, intelligence uh, informants of us pointing to them. So it's just not enough to convict. Soon they'd be there, and they say, "Well, I guess you know." Did, you, did the FBI ever talk to about uh, if they had any knowledge about? We tried, we tried in, wouldn't say anything, and then um, agreed to cooperate initially. And all they did was tell us about. So. Yeah, they were they were some of the best, um, yeah. and, and they had, that's how they got their reputation in this area. People are trapped in history, and history is trapped in them. In 1875, pioneers and leaders of the Mahoning Valley set out to collect and preserve the historical origins of the community. In 1964, Mahoning Valley Historical Society opened to the public through the legacy of Olive Arms, now known as Arms Family Museum. In 2014, a landmark downtown Youngstown building became Tyler History Center through the generous spirit of Jean D. Tyler. Our locations serve this community in different ways, yet remain true to the vision and passion for saving our stories. Visit us online at mahoninghistory.org to see why preserving Mahoning Valley history is our pledge to you. So tell us, when you came to town, um, did you know about the Mahoning Valley? Did you know about our history? No. Did you know about Crime Town USA? Uh, Not at all. I got here in 1990, summer 90, and uh, I remember one person down in, uh, came from the Huntington, West Virginia office at the time, and they said, uh, oh, you're going to Youngstown, and that's that a uh, congressman is trafficking, and I never heard of him. <laughs> and so, you know, I was, you know, looking forward to another, uh, not really looking forward to it, but I, I avoided being sent to New York City, a big city, and uh, many of my classmates were. So I said, all right, you know, new job, new location, start over, you know. Uh, you were involved towards the end with trafficking in, the, in some part in the investigation, right? right? Correct. So, correct. did you ever get a chance to talk to him? No, I never did. Uh, never spoke to him at all. I did. Probably the closest I was to him was uh, my wife was a teacher in Poland, and I was at a um, award ceremony that the Poland teachers were having, and he was the guest speaker. And it's about you know maybe he was like three or four people ahead of me in a buffet line. That was about it. 
And then uh, during his trial, I went up to see the agents in Craig Morford uh, to watch a little bit of the trial one day. And uh, so it was a break in the trial and uh, I went up and was talking to Craig Morford and traffic was at his desk and he kept like looking at me like, who's this guy? Who's this guy? <laughs> now, I didn't say nothing to him. I just walked away. But that, that's about the extent of me actually meeting or talking to traffic. In, in addition to organized crime, you also did public corruption. And the list is, you know, the list of our uh, infamous uh, corrupt public officials. You had Philomena, Phil Chance, Bill Fergus. You had judges. You had lawyers. And you had Chuck Onesti, who actually right. admitted to being a friend of Lenny Strollo, but explained that when Chuck got cancer, and I knew Chuck a long time, so did Paul, Chuck said that Lenny was arranging for cancer medicine to be brought from Mexico for him. And that's why he maintained this relationship. But on tape, Chuck is having a conversation about Paul Gaines and how after Paul had beaten Philomena in the Democratic primary, that they had to do something about it. And Chuck is heard on tape as telling Lenny, I think, we need to set him up with a woman and drugs and then nab him that way. And Lenny's answer was, what the hell? The guy is single. He goes with women all the time. It's not going to make any difference. So, so sorry, you know, maybe that would have been a better explanation. Right, right. But that shows you, again, people pitching ideas to Lenny all the time. And I mean, if he was close to the person, he knew Chuck, so he could say that. Yes, yeah. Other people, he was polite. He listened to him and let him go on their way. And then afterwards, they, you know, the guy's a nut. You know, what does he want me to do? So I mean, um, and one thing it was, everybody kind of came to him and treated him, you know, like a big shot. But um, I never saw him actually try to play the act of the big shot, uh, which was kind of weird. I mean, you see in the movies the like uh, Marlon Brando and stuff like that. Right. He never really had, you know, people, uh, underlings uh, that worked for him kissing his feet and everything else. I mean, uh, they'd come up and talk to him like we're talking now. But he did go through the, pr uh, the ceremony when he was made a made man because they, he, they brought that, the, car, the holy card or whatever the thing and, and cut his finger with the blood yeah. and all of that. Yeah. And, and did he talk about that? Did he... Did you yeah, it, Talked about there was the uh, we had the Pittsburgh agents over and they were talking about and it was uh, him Joey and it was somebody else maybe that might have been gone through the ceremony at the same time and uh, they talked you know about he talked about it, what it was like and stuff and the Pittsburgh guys knew all the players he was talking about and they had might have had some intelligence about that time frame that that was going on that you know that might have happened. So when when our local elected officials all decided to make deals with you guys uh, to, you know, get a lesser sentencing and all of that. Um, what did they say? Did they say, how did they justify their corruption and their corrupt natures, or did they? Um, well, it's very similar to when, uh, remember, I think Tony Spranza had the case that, and, the, uh, and Judge Kerrigan was involved. Yes. That was the reason at the time. And it was uh, fixing traffic cases. Yes. And we these people and say, we're going to talk to you about this DUI case you had. And they go, oh, I had that taken care of. And he knew we were the FBI. And we say we were. And they say, oh, we had to take care of it. And so well, that's what we're here to talk to you about. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. You know, and they just thought that's the way you do business in town. I mean, it wasn't a thing. You pay the money and your ticket goes away or gets reduced. Um, yeah, for, you know, Kerrigan, his explanation, and, and unfortunately, his explanation was he took lunch money, and, and that was, you know, the, the, when they were putting money in his pocket in, the, in his office when they were wanted to fix cases. But Philomena was a different level. Yeah. I mean, he was absolutely, and, and at one point, uh, Paul Gaines, during one of the elections, talked about justice for sale. And I think, yeah. you know, I think, uh, you know, the, that to me was the most disappointing because I had supported uh, Jimmy when he ran and the Vindicator endorsed him because he was brilliant, he was a great lawyer, you know, he was, uh, he was very good. And I, what happened to him? I don't know, you see, one, there was, uh, it's going back in the early 90s maybe or so and uh, Youngstown, I was working with uh, Mark Wall, 
with the Youngstown Police Department, a stolen car, and then uh, uh, there were burglars, a group of burglars from uh, the Austin area out there. And we had a guy that was, uh, we arrested, and we found a bunch of money in his uh, house, hidden in the house, some jewelry and stuff like that. I had an informant, and the informant said, the case is going to get fixed. And um, I told Mark Wallet, and he said, no, Philomena's got the case, and he's going to get the guy, he's going to get him. And Larry Sedita was this, uh, right. this, this was the defense lawyer. So they had a hearing, and um, Mark Wallet, the lawyer, um, and the subject they were going to go in to meet with, I don't know if the subject was there or not, but uh, they were going to go meet Philomena in there and talk about the case, to so work out any kind of a plea agreement or whatever. So Mark was all set to walk in, walks in, and there's Larry Sedita and Jim Philomena, and Larry tells Philomena, get him out of here. I don't want him in here. Philomena tells Mark Wild, who was the uh, officer you know, working the case, right. uh, step outside, Mark. And Mark was like, what? So he steps outside. And uh, a couple minutes later, Larry Sedita walks out, flips the money that was seized, and goes, see ya. And then uh, the guy was reduced, you know, the crime was reduced to uh, almost a misdemeanor. I mean, the guy didn't do any jail time. At some and point, Larry, at some point, Larry, at some point, Larry wore a wire for the FBI, right? Yes, he did. That was, and, and, uh, and actually had a conversation with Philomena. Right. Stu Banks first. Yeah. He wore the wire and then Larry and then Philomena. Yeah. If I may Go interject, ahead. you know, John. Um, there were police officers knew about, obviously, Mark Wallet figured it out, and there were some other police officers who knew about it. Oh, the drug task guys knew about it too as well. Yeah. All the time. And, and, and they, they never really spoke with me before the election. Um, and I heard about it from clients, um, um, and that's why I ran against him, because nobody else would. But... But it's interesting because what, what I was told, and I don't know if you can confirm this or not, John, but I was told that there were some officers who would stop somebody, they might confiscate the drugs, they wouldn't charge them, they'd throw the drugs away, and, and they actually started doing business on their own because they felt it wasn't gonna, justice wasn't going to be done anyway. Now, I don't know if you ever heard of any of that. I heard of a couple of guys doing it, and after I won the election and it got back to me, I, I just said, look, I don't care what you guys did beforehand. That's not going to happen here. So stop it. And, and uh, that was a message I sent out right. to YPD guys. But I knew a lot of them. So I, I just remember uh, George Stat Sattler was telling us about that in the Drug Task Force. Not what you just talking about, Paul, but that Philomena uh, was just taking money from these uh, the drug people, taking the money and dropping charges or reducing charges. Yeah. And the other thing was, which really upset me, was he was. Uh, for the right price, reducing the bonds that uh, these guys were being held on, and oh. then go out and retaliation murders, and that's why we're having 98, 99 people a year getting See? killed. And, and Kriptak, don't forget when Officer Kriptak got shot. Remember raiding that house on Glenwood Avenue? Yeah. Yeah, I, I attribute that to Philomena yeah. fixing the cases. So, in, in the end, <clears throat> because of your, the FBI's effort, and, and honestly, uh, we we knew that the FBI was so suspicious of even law enforcement in the area that you took certain people into your confidence. Of course, Randy Wellington was one of the people that who you know had a real close relationship with you. You'll talk to Angara a lot. Uh, wouldn't talk to the sheriff even when Eddie Nemeth was sheriff. There, there was no not you know sort of sharing of information. Um, how did you go and and? when you would go to conferences and you'd go around to other parts of the country and talk to other FBI agents and U.S. Attorney's Office. You know, the reason I ask this is after uh, the, the trial, uh, of, I think Chance's trial it was, or no, I'm sorry, Bernie Oshawa's Altshuler's trial, uh, US Attorney, Assistant U.S. Attorney Julia Stiller from Washington made this comment that was you know, widely publicized. I couldn't believe there was a place as corrupt as Mahoning County. That is, this is somebody coming out of Washington. Right, but there's other places in the country just as corrupt. Okay. Uh, That's the question I, I, I worked I have. down in West Virginia, 
Yeah. And um, the corruption there was, was rampant, especially this one county, Mingo County. We divided counties where the, the biggest employer, the coal mines were going out of business, and the biggest employer was a school district. And the school board was like the mafia, really. They controlled who got what jobs and everything else. <laughs> And then the sheriff's job was actually sold to a guy who opened a, uh, he had owned a coal mine equipment repair business. And he was probably one of the wealthiest guys down there. And he bought the sheriff's job for $100,000 and he became the sheriff. No prior law experience. There was vote buying, was rampant. And we worked our way up and eventually we got Arch Moore, who was the governor of West Virginia. Right. And starting from that one county. So uh, I heard about it when we, and I, just assumed, all right, just another corrupt place, just like down there. Yeah. Um, and I, we've had you, I don't know how long we've had, but I appreciate the time you're spending with us. Um, as far as what ha what's happening now, how would you define the Mahoning Valley today in terms of public corruption, in terms of organized crime? And, you know, give us your sense of what's going on in our community today. Well, I retired in 2012. Right. And, uh, I've been a year and a half. I've been actually almost two years. I've been uh, out of there. So uh, I can't speak what's going on today. Uh, I know that organized crime in Pittsburgh, and uh, as a few, you know, two or three years ago, and in Youngstown wasn't much at all. And there might be a few wannabes um, trying to say that they're throwing their weight around pretending to be um, uh, mafia guys. Uh, so I don't know about that. The corruption, I think, has uh, been reduced a, a lot compared to what it was. All right. And, uh, so I think about it. And again, some people liked the way it were, and they were kind of mad at what we did. But I mean, <laughs> you have to have some kind of justice system. You know? When you first heard that Paul had been shot, what was your reaction? Um, unbelievable that, you know, they'd shoot a They'd shoot somebody. I mean, but, but Paul was the second lawyer they shot. They shot Gary yeah, Verbach. Right. Yes, they did. So, you know, you know, shot in a lawyer, but then he was going to be coming in. So initially I didn't connect it to, you know, to the organized crime guys or for politics or anything, you know. You know John, I, that, they, that's interesting but, because neither did I, because I survived it. It never occurred to me when the shooting occurred that this was part of the mafia. It just right. uh, it never occurred to me. Just because a side... Go ahead. So I know all about, uh, you probably heard this of Mark Batcho, because Batcho shot you. But in talking to him about it, when he walked into, you know, they were casing your place out for quite a right. while. And then we're taking turns really like two hours on, you know, next if he comes up in the next two hours, it's your turn to get him, you know, and <laughs> three guys in the car. And it just had the Batcho's turn. And Batcho, you know, you walk inside, you let the garage, the garage door open, let the cat out. Bacho goes in, and he wasn't wearing his glasses. So he comes up, there was a crack or something, and there was a coat on it. And he says, yeah, I'm pointing my gun at this, what I thought was Gaines, and saying, hey, mister, hey, mister. <laughs> yeah, hey, mister. He says, I realized there was a coat on a coat rack. <laughs> yeah, I heard, I, 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 I saw that, or heard about that testimony that he said, hey, mister, hey, mister. And I wasn't sure what he was talking about. Because I think yeah. he went to the front door first, because there were footprints on the front porch. In the kitchen, that's when he came in and shot you. And then after he shot you, he, uh, again, the bullets didn't work. I mean, it's kind of weird. You know, you do a hit, you buy used, I mean, homemade bullets. But <laughs> luckily for you, it worked. Well, <laughs> John, honestly, I, I think what happened is I, I think, and I, I don't remember if it was Craig Morford or maybe one of the BCI agents, that they had, they had reloaded the ammunition. And we think that they had put extra hot loads in because, oh. the, the, you know, and maybe that explains he didn't have his glasses on why he missed on the second shot because it, right. it, it missed me. Yeah, the second uh, shot the hit second, your phone, right? No, no. The, yeah, it hit yes. my caller ID your and caller not that, ID. the landline. Yeah. But um, so, so the only thing I could figure that happened, because I believe his testimony was that he couldn't pull the trigger in the revolver, that the cylinder right. wouldn't turn. Right. So I'm thinking so, that the primer backed out of the shell casing, jamming the cylinder against the frame of the weapon. And that's uh, what caused it to jam, because I'd never heard of a revolver jamming. Yeah, and then so, so they get back in the car, and he tells Riddle and those guys what happened. And then Riddle tells him, go go back in there with a knife and finish him off. And he goes, I'm not going to go back to the knife. And then they both, they all took off. 
you know, um, Bacho contacted me uh, when, we oh. were, when we were still in business from prison and wanted to talk to me and gave me all his numbers and told me when I called the prison what information to give them and to say that he has requested and to send the, he had sent me and sent a written request and all of that. So I called the prison and I said, you know, Mark Batcher would like to have a discussion with me and I identified myself and she said, well, we're going to call you back. We have to, I have to talk to my supervisor. And uh, they said, uh, you know, they called back and, and they said, uh, sorry, you're not going to be able to talk to Mark Batcho. And I said, why? And they said, we put him in isolation and he's not allowed to have any visitors. <laughs> I said, okay. And then I never, I tried to contact him again, but couldn't. But uh, yeah, it, it, it was always funny because when, and, and I'm, I'm being disrespectful to Paul when I say this, but when I used to make speeches about organized crime and corruption in the Valley, and people would ask me, you know, are you ever afraid of writing? Because I, you know, I wrote all these columns about you know, Lenny Strollo's blood money and all of this kind of stuff. And I said, no, I said, consider this. I said, there's a mob hit on Paul Gaines and the shooter standing over him and the gun doesn't fire. I said, I'm such a small target, they'll <laughs> never shoot me. So they used to laugh at that. But that became a funny story about how he was actually standing over Paul when he, fired, when he tried to hit, fire the gun. Yeah, that's yeah. what he, why you remember, John. Yeah, John, I have a question. Um, I'm interested that you said that, that a lot of people were upset that, with what you guys had done. There is a sense in this community that this corruption is accepted or was accepted. And I wonder if you had any sense of how widespread that was and if you have any sense that after all of this happened, if it's changed. I think it changed uh, for the better, but I think a lot of, I hate to say the word, but uh, maybe a lot of the old school thinking died off was the people died off as they got older. Um, younger people, I think, you know, maybe have a better sense of what's right and what's wrong than with the old steel mill way. He's not saying it was the steel mill's fault or anything, but just the way things were done in the past. I mean, if you look at, uh, I know I've heard this before, the uh, history of Youngstown with uh, the way the immigrants came over and in Europe, how it was corrupt over there and you had to dumps and stuff like that. And I think those people and their families have passed on and the younger people know the difference between right and wrong. So, uh, and it's not, uh, not everybody was corrupt and it was just a, a few. And uh, they talked about the old ways, the old ways, and no matter where you go, even out here, people talk about the old ways, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I don't think it's, uh, it's it definitely it's not as bad as it was. But uh, it, like I said, it wasn't everybody, but it was just, you know, ingrained maybe in some people. Do you think it was more extreme here than it is in other areas of the country? Because that's the other sense, that it only happens in Youngstown or Mahoning County. I hear that a lot. No, no. I grew up in uh, Long Island, and uh, I remember my dad talking about in our, a county, it was Nassau County, and uh, the corrupt politicians and things like that that they were involved in. Uh, you really need people to come forward or the investigators need a good break and somebody on the inside to, to stop that. Um, so it, it's everywhere. I, I spent, um, when I was in Youngstown, I spent 18 months in Washington, D.C. working for a uh, detailed the Homeland Security office. And uh, it just the local, the things you pick up locally, you could tell you know, the whole, I mean, it's around every city, uh, anywhere in the country, it's around. You know, uh, one of the things, though, that I found in, in writing about this extensively was a lack of shame, uh, not only on the part of the criminals, but if you, you, you saw all the letters that were written on behalf of all of these people who were, I think, mm -hmm. from priests, you know, very, very well-known priests, from judges. There was a big drug dealer who you all nabbed, and there were judges who wrote on behalf of him about what a wonderful man he is. And, and you know, and you, other politicians and business leaders. I mean, it, it was no... It was as though they didn't care that sooner or later the Vindicator would find out about these letters and we'd write about it. And, and right. one day I talked to uh, Monsignor Di Morenas, who was the pastor of St. Anthony Church in Briar Hill, where Joey Naples went and all of these had been. Joey Naples was buried. And I went to Joey Naples' burial mass. Uh, one of his relatives invited me, so I went there. And I saw all the guys from Pittsburgh in their dark suits and black ties and pinky rings. And they all were in the front row. And Monsignor de Morenis, in his homily, talked about this wonderful family man, 
this outstanding, and I wrote a column about it, and he demanded to have a meeting with me, and he was there with several other leaders of the Italian community, and they told me I hated Italians, and I said, no, I don't hate Italians, number one, I'm ethnic. And I said, number two, I said, how is it that a Catholic priest has no qualms about a burial mass for a mobster whose business was murder? And he says, well, the Lord is forgiving. And I thought at that point, I, I threw up my hands, and I said, okay. So that was, I think, what I found most disturbing was this lack of shame and, and understanding. You see it here, too. Uh, a few months back down here, uh, Berkeley County, which is the county north of us, um, they, they had a school board, might have been a president or one of the members, embezzled a million dollars from the, uh, wow. well, he might have been the treasurer or something, a million dollars from the school board. Uh, and when it came time to a sentencing, different people in the community still wanted this guy's defense and prominent people. It's like, what wow. are you doing? And I, it's one of those things I'll never understand. Right. Well, listen, uh, we appreciate all the time. I have one more question. Okay, I, have I have one question. more question. Sure. I want to get sure. back to the question that Bertram had about uh, when you were interviewing these guys, what kind of individuals did you see in front of you? You know, were they, uh, because everybody in the community, as he said, accepts these guys as great neighbors, great friends. How did they come across to you when you were, were interrogating them or interviewing them? Um, they were civil. Um, I mean, Lenny, I mean, uh, my grandmother's Italian, my great grandmother and great grandpa came from Italy. And so he reminded me of my grandparents. <laughs> uh, they, um, most of them were either, they didn't want to talk to you at all, uh, Bernie. Right. Bernie Mitchell was the only guy I arrested twice in my career. Is that arrested right? Down, arrested him in Charlotte with the Dinsey. With, we only got uh, Amos' son and Bernie in Charlotte. And then at the house, his house on, uh, was it Goldberg or Goldie Road or whatever it is. Goldie. Goldie. And uh, when at that ha that point, uh, I said, Bernie, I'm John Stoll. And he goes, I thought that was you. <laughs> you know, but... <laughs> Tell us a story about uh, Emma and James being, you were looking for them after that bank robbery, and you will found them in Youngstown. Tell us that story, because it's a fascinating little story. Um, well, I ha I ha it was always the case agent, but I was in uh, Quantico taking an uh, in-service class there, and uh, so Larry Lynch was kind of running it right. uh, for me, and then he called me and said, hey, we got a good source, it's got, you know, point them out, this and that where they'd be. So the highway patrol, we got uh, Brian Gertz and he helped us out and he set up a road, road stop. They stopped these guys on the uh, Route 11 in Camfield. And their giant, John Violi, who was uh, with Bezetta Township Police Department at the time. Was driving them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they were, on, they were on Rochester, actually, to do another burglary, supposedly. But right. Uh, he said he was going to turn him in or something yeah, like that. Yeah, he said, when he was asked about it, he said that he, his family, the, their family had asked him to escort Emil and James to prison. And that's what he was doing when he found them in the car. Right. <laughs> so. When I tried to talk to him in the jail, uh, he came in the room, saw me, and he says, I'm not talking to you. I mean, they were polite. Uh, uh, it's their job to get away with, it's our job to catch him. But... Um, uh, Phil Chance was polite. Um, these guys were friendly, polite, and, and said not too many. You debrief him with the lawyer. Um, initially, they're very, uh, if they're cooperating, they're very reluctant, and then they warm up, and then you're just another person to them. You know, mm -hmm. they talk to you that way. Um, one final, and I, if you have any more anecdotes, we'd, we'd like to hear them, but we were talking about Joey Naples, and Bob Corner was telling me when uh, they went and uh, they had a uh, search warrant for Naples house on Colada on the north side uh, Bob Cronin says they walked in and he said it was the most meticulous clean house he had ever seen everything was in order everything was in its right place nothing was out of place and he said in the garage there was some special tile on the flooring of the garage that was spotless even though they parked their cars in there and I thought, what a, what a great description of a mob boss in the Mahoning Valley, you know. That, uh... yeah. No, I mean, they, they were, 
you know, normal. I mean, they had families, they had kids, uh, they had neighbors, and um, they weren't like you know cavemen. They were just regular people. And there was, the, you know, there's their like a, a, a somebody in one of the criminals arrested West Virginia, and he said, you know, it's your job to catch me. It's my job for you not to catch me. And uh, that was that was their thing. And you just never knew, uh, you know. And there's things you see. Over time, I'm sure you've seen too, where you hear something about somebody, it really surprise you. I never, you know, thought he'd do that. Right. And that's like, you know, as a hostage negotiator, you learn that you, you can't judge people by your value system. And uh, so you got to, you, you know, show empathy, but not sympathy, and then listen to them and understand them and then uh, get what you need from them, you know. Well, John, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. Uh, I'll be in touch with you, and then as the book is coming along, I'll, I'll be in touch. But one thing I do want to do is, what's your relationship? With, do you have a relationship with Lenny at all anymore? Um, was was kind of funny. Was the last time I had been retired, oh, uh, a year or so, and um, I had no. I had, in fact, in my last year in FBI it was like 2012, and I went to the doctor. I had pneumonia. And I came out of my doctor's office, and across the hall was another doctor's office, and he was going in. And I saw him. He goes, "Hey, John," and "Hey, Lenny," you know. And I, you know, he went to go shake my hand. I said, "Hey, I got, got pneumonia. I'm not going to be shaking hands." And we talked how he's doing. He, you know, he had some health problems. I right. said this around 2012. He still has some health problems. And uh, maybe oh, a year or two before that, I was getting some physical therapy, and uh, in walks um, his wife, Antoinette. Yeah. And we're just like nothing. We went to our kids had a concert and um, school concert in Poland High School. And right in front of us sat um, Antoinette and Raymond Hertz's uh, wife and kids. Wow. And they were there seeing, you know, one of their granddaughters. And uh, I mean, Lenny was still in jail at the time. And it was just, you know, you see these people, you know, in your community and they just... Right. You know, and the, reason I'm the reason I'm asking about Lenny is I've been trying to get an interview with him uh, and I do a video, you know, interview with him and with the promise that I'll hold on to it until he dies and then I'd air it. And uh, <laughs> his response cannot be aired, even though this is a podcast. He, 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 and after he abused me, he said, tell that SOB he owes me money for all the newspapers he sold writing about me. But I'm trying to find somebody <laughs> to do an interview. So if you get a chance, you know, maybe, perhaps you and I can go visit him. And, uh, <laughs> and so, uh, but I do appreciate the time, John. And, and it's, it's okay. a wonderful, no great problem. stories, great insight. And that's exactly what I needed. Thank you. And we'll be right. in touch. Thanks very much. Right. Take care, Paul. John, right. it was great to see you. And, and you, you look too. good. And hope, I hope that you enjoy yourself down there. And okay. make sure, and make sure that you're, you'll be safe when you're flying. That's right. Safety yeah. first. Yes, yes, sir. Take care, John. Uh, Thank John. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us, and a special thanks to our guests, retired FBI agent John Stoll, former Youngstown Vindicator Regional Editor Cynthia Rickard, and Mahoney County Prosecutor Paul Gaines. Watch for part two of this podcast, where we continue our conversation about the botched 1996 mob hit on Gaines. This podcast is produced by Robert McFerrin, the talented former art director of the Youngstown Vindicator, and members of his production team, Andy Kunkel and Megan Christensen. Please join us next month for more conversations about our past and our future. Thank you for being with us, and we will see you next time. The best profit of the future is the past. As important as it is to collect and preserve artifacts, how stories are told will shape their understanding for generations to come. Mahoning Valley Historical Society shares our local history through exhibits, programs, online platforms, and live events throughout the year. Being a valued resource to local news media further extends our educational support.
Visit us online at mahoninghistory.org to see why teaching Mahoning Valley history is our pledge to you.